Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at this year's 2012 Detroit Jazz Festival here in downtown Detroit. Tonight here as part of this year's festivities, pianist, educator, and producer Arturo O'Farrell is going to be performing selections with his septet featuring special guest Donald Harrison on alto saxophone. As you might know, he has a brand new record called The Negoshi Sessions, which is a solo piano project in which he takes songs from the great American songbook as well as the Latin songbook and records it and puts his own unique twist to each particular song, ranging from Danny Boy to Cole Porter's music. Tonight we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about the new project. We're also going to sit down and talk about the educational component of something that he's very, very passionate and adamant about. As you might know, he formed a program called the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance, which is dedicated and its mission is to educate and inform people about their Latin American as well as Latin roots as music and jazz. We're also going to sit down and talk about the origins of how people are appreciating and accepting jazz music now at a time when jazz music is not part of the masses. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. Arturo Ferro live here at this year's 2012 Detroit Jazz Festival here in downtown Detroit. Congratulations on the Nagushi Sessions and this solo piano record, really, you are going all over the place. You do traditional standards, you do some Latin classics, as well as some, some originals of your own on here. Yeah, I had a really, really, and it's funny because I had a lot of, of, of practice time. 
35 years. <laughs> But I came, man, no, it's funny because, you know, I played for two years at a little place in Brooklyn called Puppets. And I did everything, free jazz, straight up Latin, uh, stride, experimental and contemporary and Bill Evans type piano playing. And uh, and so I prepared really meticulously for this record. And then when, so I didn't know how long it would take. When the time came to record it, man, I just sat down and like an hour and a half later, it was done. <laughs> now, I understand that. You took, you had your Steinway placed in a museum, and it was after hours, and you just went to work and did what you did. Yeah, the the, the Steinway, I'm, I'm a Steinway artist, which I'm very proud of, because it's a beautiful instrument, man. And uh, somehow I was able to, uh, you know, ask the Steinway people to let me pick a piano, and I went to the showroom, and the, well, they're all Lamborghinis. I mean, they they line them up against the wall, man, and it's like, man, you're like a kid in a candy shop. You're like, oh, I want that one, I want that one, oh, I want. It took us like an hour, man. We picked the beautiful one, uh, the Steinway, and this, the Noguchi Museum, which is an incredible, incredible national treasure. Uh, allowed me to come in after hours, lock the door, and just sit there with my engineer and a couple of friends and and just record. It was. It was incredible. It was religious, man, because I, you know those works for me, the 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 the, the, the sculptures and the, the things that are in that museum are incredible. They're spiritual masterpieces. You know, there's some songs on here, a couple of them that just really stick out. One of them is your take on Danny Boy. In fact, Jackie Wilson probably is the next person who has really taken that song and took it to a whole nother level. It's almost kind of spiritual how you play that song. You know, it's, it, it's, it's about taking the tools of oppression and using the very same tools for liberation. And for me, that piece of music written as a minstrel song and as some sort of, you know, really ugly piece of racism, was a beautiful melody and a beautiful part, really, of an American period where there was a different vibe, there was a different set of principles. And so, even though the people that wrote that song didn't know it, they wrote a beautiful piece of music. And, uh, and I just feel like that, that, that's something that I really, really admire and treasure, is the beauty and the abstract, abstractness of art. So, uh, you know, other people have played that, but I thought it was important to point out that it was originally a very racist song. And, um, and to reclaim it, to reclaim it in the name of beauty, of great American melody, and, 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 and simplicity. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a product of my own chaos, man. <laughs> if I can make it difficult, if I can make it confusing, I will. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, bro? So I'm striving every single day of my life, my, my wife will disagree, I strive every single day in my life to find a modicum of simplicity. And that piece for me was a chance to really centralize and break down and dilute to its smallest uh, 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 segment. Another song on there is Secret Love. In fact, Secret Love was a real, real popular song in the late 40s and also in the 50s. And you kind of reworked it and you re kind of renamed it also. I took the same principle that I did with Danny Boy and applied it to Once I Had a Secret Love, which we all know as jazz musicians, we all know Once I Had a Secret Love. But this, I took kernels of what I thought were just the basic A statement and just created something that I loved just because I couldn't get past the simplicity of those triads and the simplicity of that opening lines of the melody. Um, really we spend a lot of time playing all kinds of extensions and chord extensions and fast runs and uh, complicated polytonality and two-fisted barrel piano playing and i just really i'm getting maybe because i'm getting old <laughs> i want to take things really slow and just love them and 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 feel you know the goodness and grace of being a musician in 2012. <laughs> Thank you. 
you know, another thing too that you've you've done tremendously also throughout your career is the most important thing is this Afro alliance that you've put together. And you want people to really understand the connection and the history of Afro-Cuban music, not just here in the United States, but also abroad. You know, I'm a jazz musician, man. I woke up to life and said, here I am, what do I want to do? I want to be a jazz musician. The tradition of jazz, the greatness of it. I don't care if I'm Latino. I don't care if I'm Bavarian, German, uh, Mexican, Cuban. don't matter. I'm a jazz musician. That's what I was meant. That's what I was created for. But, you know, we talk about America as American, and we talk about jazz as an American art form. And I think that's a mistake, and I'll tell you why. It's an African art form. The expression of it through this country is called jazz. The expression of it through Cuba is called guaguancó. The expression of this music through Brazil is called candomble. I mean, there's, this music is the music of Africa. I don't care what you say. It's the music of the diaspora. And if you're honest, you won't co-opt it and call it Brazilian or American or German or Swiss. You'll call it what it is. It's Afro, whatever you want to call it. It's African. The rhythms, the improvisation, the whole practice of it, everything that we do is rooted. And if you, look, if you listen to African music, and I can hear Randy Weston... <laughs> in my ear talking but if you listen to African music you will understand that what we do is quintessentially African if you listen to Thelonious Monk you're listening to an African musician I mean it is it's such an important part of what we do so whatever derivation we take thereof and I'm of the opinion by the way that jazz is also Latino that, uh, like Jelly Roll Morton said you can't, without the Spanish tinge it is in jazz so I feel like back in the roots of the beginning of this music in in New Orleans there was a heavy influence and inter influence of African Americans and Afro Latinos because the neighborhoods in New Orleans to this day are divided very heavily along Latino and black lines and so there was a lot of, of, of inter inter influencing and, 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 and a lot of counter influencing and I think that you can't look at this music and not recognize the Cubanness in it. You can do a lot of things, but you can, and the, at, the, at the end of the day, what you cannot do is you cannot look at this music and say it's quintessentially classical American music. Aaron Copeland, we got something to say about that, you know? It's music, it's music of the Americas, expressed through American minds, and music that was, was created, really, the practice of it in Africa. And, 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 and I'm grateful for that because as a European musician, you have one set of ears. As an African musician, you have another set of ears. And I'm pretty sure I know which one, <laughs> which one I prefer. But, you know, I'm just talking, man. That's just me. I'm just a piano player. <laughs> <laughs> More than that, you know, part of the Alliance, too, is to educate and enrich people about what you're talking about and I think that was what Tito Puente said you know he denounced the term salsa music because he thought that it was just uh, a, it was a rabbit statement to a music that had an identity to his culture you know it's funny because a lot of musicians who are credited with creating salsa all agree with Tito Puente um, there is no real salsa per se it's a continuation of Afro-Cuban music, which is a continuation, really, of the roots of jazz. And um, our educational goals are actually pretty, I want to say devious, but they're not devious because they're not sneaky. No, subversive is a better word. Our subversive mission is this, is to remind kids, young Hispanic and black kids, of the greatness of their culture and the greatness of their roots. So when we go into school, to, we want to teach them music, general music principles in our residencies and in our, our, our work with kids. We want to teach them how to read A flat, how to play a major scale. That's the ultimate goal for everyone. But we want to do it by them having to recognize it, the greatness of their culture, man. Because sometimes these kids don't realize that they're royalty, that they come from a noble, noble musical heritage. And so, you know, we, we really, the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance is, is built along those principles, recognizing culture, embracing culture, 
and using it as a tool to, to, to better ourselves, better our children, better our future. And that's, we work really, really hard because we're a small organization. But, we, you know, to have residencies in the schools, to commission works, to put on uh, seasons, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not a big institution. But uh, we're tireless, man, and we're not going to stop because it's just a job that never ends. <laughs> Jazz music now is harder to be marketed and the lack of people of color and Latin descent are attending these clubs and these venues to hear great music. I'm going to go ahead and say stuff that most people think but very few people are willing to say. Don't hold it against me because I'm not the only one who feels this way. There is a whole reason why jazz is not hitting home with our community um, and why jazz is a huge hit with the academic and institutional life. I'm going to be directly bold and this is not an attack on anyone because uh, I think the folks that represent this are fighting a very valiant and courageous battle. Um, not all the time. And everything that you say, by the way, folks, has to be taken. You know, every, there's no absolutes. Try and, try and have a sense of humor about all this and try and look at the big picture of all this. But the big institutions have decided to treat jazz as if it was classical music. They've decided to put a tuxedo on it and canonize it and demand that it be given the same dignity that a Brahms symphony might be given. Well, let me tell you something. Classical musicians are struggling to keep that music alive. Um, and I'm going to tell you something. Jazz is not musical wallpaper meant to evoke strains of an era where jazz was a centrist view of some classical necrophilic love affair. Jazz is bold, it's subversive, it'll tear a hole in your complacency, 
And if you don't create this music with the understanding that it's revolutionary, then you're not current. You're not contemporary and you're not relevant. And the people that are making inroads in this jazz don't treat it like it's covered in a plastic cover. Don't treat it like it's there's a doily on top of it. And and I'm not really I'm not calling anyone out because I love some of our leaders more than you might understand. But when you insist that a music be treated with respect, you're denying its inherent respect to begin with. It doesn't need to be classical music. It has as much, if not more, dignity than classical music. And what has happened is that by clothing it in garb of high socioeconomic insistence, you've really made it the sport of the elite. It's expensive to go see music. It should not be. It should not be expensive to see musicians play this music. Our birthright. It should not be. And I think that because it's become so expensive to maintain these structures and these buildings and these colleges and these institutions, man, you're denying the essence of this music, which was created. The true democracy of jazz was that it was created for all not just those who could afford the tuition or the concert season ticket price. I'm sorry, I'm gonna call it what it is. And here's the thing that happens. Our community is not always a wealthy one. My people, your people, <laughs> most of us are limping along. And so the people that end up getting into these colleges, into these places of power are not people who are necessarily people of color. Now that's rough. I wanna say that I never saw music as a game of color anyway. But the institutions have so plastic wrapped this music and called it the this or that of the great art of America. And a lot of people are scared of it. A lot of normal folks are scared of it. They think you have to have money or be educated to listen to it. And you know what? You don't have to have money or be edu educated to listen to Mozart. You just have to open your ears. Um, the educations, you look at the color of the skin of most of the students in America. It has nothing to do with black or white. The predominantly white jazz institutions are predominantly populated by white students and white faculty. That's a little off-putting to people who are Hispanic or African American. I'm not saying it's wrong or right. I'm just saying that we need to take the relevance back. We need to make this music forward-looking. We need to embrace its multiculturality. We need to embrace its Panamericism. When we do this and we stop talking about rappers, and man, rap is beautiful, man. There's some beautiful things we can do with rap. And, and I mean, we got so much growing up to do in terms of embracing the best parts of our culture and not retreating into classicism. Because that's what we do. We go, oh, it's not jazz. It's not jazz. That's not jazz. That's not jazz. That's not jazz. That's not jazz. This is jazz. This is jazz. This is jazz. And I'm saying that's wrong. That's so wrong. And it does such violence to this music that chose me. What it is, is you say, instead of saying, that's not jazz, that's not jazz, this is not jazz, you go, imagine what jazz could be. Imagine where they could be if we embraced this aspect, that aspect. And we cared about this, and we cared about that. Imagine musically, socially, culturally, and then industrially, where it can go. And that's my mission. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at this year's 2012 Detroit Jazz Festival here in downtown Detroit. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Arturo O'Farrell for his time, as well as the staff and management and festival organizers of this year's 2012 Detroit Jazz Festival. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Mm -hmm.